Good morning, Bethel. Welcome. Make some noise in the house. We want to greet all of our streaming family. Josie Pollock is here today with us, and it's her birthday. She's just 35 Celsius. We want to welcome you, Josie. God bless you, honey. It's good to see you. And you can welcome all of our online streamers. Hello, Warners. Hello, everybody. Well, oh, my goodness. We have been in a series, it seems, for a long time. Well, today is going to be just a little bit of ginger in between courses. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, the Lord hasn't given me a specific, didn't give me a specific message today other than to encourage you. There are some folk that need refreshment and need encouragement today, and you come to the right place to get it. You know, sometimes in life, you don't know if it's a breakdown or a breakthrough. You know, it's <laughs> the only thing in common is the word break. You don't know if it's going to break bad or it's going to break good. You don't, there's a verse in 2 Samuel 3, 1 that says, there was a long war between the house of David and the house of Saul. But it says the house of David prevailed. That scripture verse says sometimes you can't quite read where it's going. Is it a breakdown? Is it a breakthrough? And before we start a new series, because we're going to move in the direction of revival, I don't know about you, but all of my Christian life, I've been hungry and thirsty for a move of God, unlike any we've ever seen. This pulpit you've heard a million times, this was Catherine Kuhlman's pulpit. For 75 years, every preacher in the world who was anyone preached from this pulpit. And uh, it was rescued by uh, a group of church ladies, and it was brought here, and they gave it to me because they knew I had a sense of history. I've always studied revival. What does that mean? Renewal, reformation, when God does something, when he breaks through. But just prior to God breaking through, usually things are right on the tipping point. You don't know if it's a breakdown or a breakthrough in your life. You're not quite sure how to read. You know, they said at the, at the Continental Congress, there was a George Washington's chair. On the back of his chair, there was a half-rising sun. So you didn't know if it was rising or setting. And during the proceedings, someone asked Benjamin Franklin, they said, is that sun rising or setting on Washington's chair? And he said, it's rising. Sometimes you don't know what the interpretation is. I mean, is it over or is God going to do something marvelous? And I'm talking to some people today that are right on the cusp and you need a little bit of help interpreting whether it's a breakdown or a breakthrough. And <laughs> I just want to encourage you, beloved you know, many of us have been in the service of the Lord for a long time, and you get tired in the work, but you don't get tired of the work. But there's a point where you want to know, Lord, where, where's the fruitfulness that you promised? Thank God for daily bread, amen, and daily provisions. But daily bread is not the fruit that God has promised many of us in our lives. The abundant, sweet, enriched. Have you ever thought that maybe you misheard a few things? <laughs> I'm 62 now, and Josie, we're, we're not going to ask. We're not going to ask. 86. You're 86 years young. Oh, my goodness me. Usher, um, <laughs> in case she begins to dribble or anything, we're just going to take her out, please. Thank you. No, we've, we've, we've known the Lord for many decades, and we've walked with God through many decades. And, you know, I've been reminded of a, of a verse of Scripture in, in Genesis 16, verse 1, Genesis 15, verse 1. It says of Abraham, and after these things, God spoke to Abraham in a vision. After these things, what things? Well, he went through a lot of ups and downs. He's up, he's down. He's up, he's down. But do you know, I believe that we're serving in a season where God is going to make the valleys become low. He's going to take the mountains and make them low and the valleys he's going to exalt. That leaves flat 
land for us to walk on. He's going to remove the mountains. He's going to raise up the valleys and he's going to give some level ground for us to walk on so that it's just a little bit easier to interpret whether there's a breakdown or a breakthrough. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to look at Abraham for just a few minutes today. And it's going to be a little bit different today because I want to make a few points and then uh, don't be a little disturbed. I'm going to have Dennis up during the these, these little points and I want to just stop. I want to make a point, then I want to pray. And Dennis, you might feel come up next to you and put his hand on your shoulder. It isn't Jesus. Don't don't be confused or deluded. <laughs> but by grace, he will use the mediation of Dennis's hand to bring hope and encouragement to you. I just want to speak life to you. I want to say it's a breakthrough, not a breakdown. I want to just look at a few scriptures here and there, just sort of a potpourri, all to the end of you having hope. Because did you know Abraham, he, was, he had received many promises from God, extraordinary promises. Yet at 85 years of age, he hadn't seen many of them come to pass. He was 85 in the text we're dealing with today. You've been walking with the Lord, and a lot has happened. In Genesis 15, one says, after these things. What things? Well, in chapter 12 of Genesis, he leaves everything he has, or of the Chaldees. He leaves everything. God just says, go. He didn't tell him where to go. He just said, leave. And you know what he did? He left. Where? He just walked. God said, just take the next right step. You know, I want a five-year plan, a four-year plan, at least a three-day plan, something. But God originally spoke in Genesis 12 to Abraham, and he said, Beloved, I want you to leave everything you know. And by the way, he was, an, uh, he was a very wealthy man. He came from a wealthy background. So he's set in life. But he left everything that was secure to him, and he turned his back, and he walked. Where? God said, just go. You know, I don't know about you. I don't want God to tell me to leave somewhere and not tell me at least where I'm going. The Holiday Inn down the street, uh, two miles. Where, where are we going? Abraham just left. And some of you have left much in your life. And you obeyed the Lord to do it. And maybe like Abraham, you're thinking, where's the fruit? You know, he did what God said. He left. Chapter 12, chapter 13, there's trouble in Genesis. There's trouble with his, his brother's son, Lot. Abraham was a very gracious man. You ever had no boundaries in ministry and you just sort of help everybody? Well, Abraham got stuck with Lot, and that was a lot of trouble. Lot was a very carnal man. You know, there are people who know God and people who know people who know God. Abraham knew God. Lot knew Abraham. Abraham built altars. Lot built tents. He didn't have any altars. He used Abraham's altar. You know, <laughs> De Paul knew God. Demas knew Paul. You know, there are folks in life, they don't know God, but they know someone who knows God. Well, Abraham has to put up with Lot. And the scripture says that Lot was a carnal man, and, and there was dissension in the midst of all of their camp. And, and you know how bad dissension can be in the church. You don't know a fight till you've been in a church fight. You think you were jumped into a gang and that was a fight. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Get some earrings and shoes taken off in a church fight. It's nasty business. There was a bunch of tension in Genesis 13 between Lot and their herdsmen. And Abraham said, look, we've got a lot of tension here. I'll tell you what, Lot, you look wherever you want to look, and wherever you go, I'll just go the opposite direction. Lot's eyes were set on Sodom and the five cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. At that time, they looked as lush as the Garden of God. It was like Hawaii, like Maui. And so being a carnal man, Lot, the Bible says, he looked towards Sodom, pitched his tent towards Sodom. Next, we find him in the gate of Sodom as the mayor. And Abraham said, okay, you want the pretty land? You want the beautiful stuff? Go ahead and take it. I'm just going to take whatever's left. Gracious Abraham, where's the promise, Lord? He's doing everything he's doing because he was told you're going to have a son. And now he's 85. And when God appears to him in Genesis 15, it says, after all these things, oh, there's more. In Genesis 13, he goes down to Egypt. Abraham makes some stupid moral decisions. I know none of you can identify with that. He goes down to Egypt and he says to his wife, look, you're so pretty. 
She's she's in her she's in her sixties. She's in her eight seventies, late seventies now, and she's so good looking that there was a risk of taking her and putting her in Pharaoh's harem. Well, it's hard to find those girls on Christian Mingle, isn't it? <laughs> East Marmony, I, I don't know where you look. But he goes to Egypt and he says to his wife, say you're my sister, and that was half-truth because she was his half-sister. The problem with half-truths is you may get the wrong half. Half-truths like half-bricks fly further and do more damage, right? And so he goes through this humiliating time, but he comes out a rich man. You know how he got his money? No godly way. He got his money because Pharaoh bankrolled him financially just to get him out and get her out. Because God appeared in a vision and said, touch her and I'll kill you. So <laughs> Abraham's a lovely soul. And now he's got all this money because his wife's so good looking. And they barely get out by the skin of their teeth. In chapter 14, then we find out that Lot has been stolen. Lot the idiot. Always causing family trouble. And there's a war between some kings and they come down and Lot is taken. And then Abraham has to go and, and fight a battle and get him back. Here's my point. This guy had been through a lot. And some of you have been through so much. But after these things, God speaks to him. He's on the precipice of his life. And he's still at, when God, God speaks to him in Genesis 15, 1, he, he is no more fruitful than when God last spoke to him. Isn't it a weird conundrum? It's like God gives us all these promises to keep us going all these years. And they do. And we're always sort of enamored with them. And then we keep getting new words. Everywhere I go, I get a prophetic word. I don't even want one anymore. I've got 5,000 in my closet that have never come to pass since I was young and pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Yet, then someone else goes, you know, I have a, it's not so much a word as a, just a movement here. It's something I don't know. What, let me just speak it over. You know, I don't know you. Please, please. No more words. <laughs> please. I knew this lady had been married five times, living in her car, and she wants to give a pr prophetic word to all the pastors. I wanted to get her a t-shirt that said, I don't have a life, but I have a word from the Lord just for you. <sighs> did anyone see what I did with my glasses? <laughs> huh? They're not on my head. Well, glory, because I, I cannot go from memory. Well, we'll see how that works. Abraham is at a precipice in his life. He is, he is literally at a point where he's become so exhausted and all that he's gone through on a daily basis. Yes, God's given him daily bread, but the fruit that was promised him. Do you remember God took him out of his tent, out of the constriction of his own mind and said, look at the stars in the sky, a hundred billion trillion galaxies. And God said, hey, can you count them? Well, so your seed shall be. Ooh, big word, huh? Someday, not today. Abraham goes, that's probably what he's thinking. Someday, okay, I wish 10 of these 5,000 prophecies might come to pass. But in the moment, he's still, he's 90 now, all right? He's barren. Sarah's barren. He's impotent. He, it's over, okay? In the flesh, it's done. Did you know God loves to wait until it's over? He waits until it's done. He waits until it is not possible in any conceivable multiverse for you to bear fruit. I was at a restaurant not too long ago, and I remember I saw Pastor Jack Hayford walk through, just a legend in the ministry. And I just, I had to get up. I just had to get up, and he, he bless his heart, you know, decades, decades, 70 years serving the Lord. And I just went up and said, Pastor Jack, I just want to shake your hand. I just want to thank you for your faithfulness. And he just sort of shook my hand and blessed me. And boy, I, I tell you what, we have to show honor to the men and women who have given the majority of their lives, provided for daily, absolutely. They've done the next right thing always, but they've never seen the fruit. And this is where Abraham is. Do you know the feeling? He says to God, God, I am 85 years old. I, I don't know is, if there's something wrong. 
Remember the story of the man who's on the side of the cliff holding on to the last bit of grass he can hold on to, and a voice from heaven says, let go. And the guy looks up and goes, is there anyone else up there? (laughs) Come on. Abraham is at his utter breaking point. And he says, look, God, I'm 85. I'm going on 90. I can't. You told me all kinds of things. Now, don't go and promise me things if you're not going to let me see the fulfillment in my lifetime. The scripture says, stir not up my love, lest you please. Don't. There's just something about having your hopes raised up in order to be dashed yet again. That's where Abraham is. Hmm? Just like the house of Saul and the house of David, there was a long war and, and, and the, the house of David waxed stronger and stronger and the house of Saul weaker and weaker, but it still wasn't readable. Breakdown or breakthrough? Breakdown or breakthrough? Well, I'm, I'm going to prophesy over you. Just as Dennis is moving in the room, I want to pray for everyone right now. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. For the burden of any one Lord God who is questioning in their soul, is this a breakdown or a breakthrough? Father, we just speak on Josie's birthday that there would be a breakthrough for her, a breakthrough, Lord God, for all concerning her that she loves, and a breakthrough for everybody under the sound of my voice. Lord, where the, it looks like uh, it's at the tipping point. It looks like we can't read it. We don't know if it's the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end. But I thank you. We trust your interpretation, Lord, that it's a breakthrough. We trust your interpretation that as dead as Sarah's womb was, as impotent as Abraham was, that you cannot lie and fruit will come. Somebody say amen. Not just the daily bread. Because Abraham was promised a lot of fruit. Look at the stars of the heavens. And some of you have received prophetic words. And, 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 and sometimes those, the, the, exci- the initial excitement will keep you busy for a while to realize the fruit hadn't come. <laughs> you can be so shouting hallelujah from the revival tent all the way home only to realize when the enthusiasm lags that nothing that was promised has happened. You know, I received a prophecy when I was 16. There was a lady named Sister Edith Tabish, and she used to have a prophetic ministry. Couldn't see much, but she 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 would see the glory of God rest upon folk, and 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 oh, it was so exciting! It was in Long Beach, and there was a chair here and a chair there, and they'd put you in the prophetic chair. And Sister Edith would would call you or come over, and she just walked up to me and she looked at me and she said, "You'll have a bigger shield than most." And walked away. And I thought, what? (laughs) All that in a bag of chips. What the heck is that? You know when you're expecting a really delicious prophetic word and you get just, you know, you don't know if they forgot to drink their orange juice just before they prayed over you. Well, later in life, I realized the Roman shield was the full-size shield that would quench all the fiery darts of the devil. And boy, in my life, have I had to have a bigger shield than most. Amen. That didn't make sense immediately, though, did it? When I'm 16, I wanted to hear you're going to soar with eagles and and you're going to cast out devils and they'll bow down before you in the nations, all that kind of stuff. I didn't get that one. The old lady in the other chair got that one. (laughs) What the heck is he saying? She's going to be dead before she gets home. And I get all I get is he'll have a bigger shield than most. (laughs) Come on. Some of us have more words than we know what to do with, like we're shuffling a deck of cards, you know. Pick a card, pick a word, any word. Pick a word, any word. Well, Abraham is at a breaking point in his life. And more than anything else, he needs a word from the Lord to sort of break the deadlock. Is this a breakdown? Is this a breakthrough? And the scripture says at God's altar, as the light breaks, he learns the reason for the delay in the possession of his inheritance. Did you know, beloved, there are reasons why your fruitfulness has been delayed? And you're not responsible for most of them. You're not responsible. It's not your fault. 
that everything has not been arranged in many cases. Though there are a lot of things that are our fault. But you know in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, the scripture tells us about the ministry of John the Baptist. That It says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and of the reign of Trachonitus, and Licinius was the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came to John. All the furniture, politically, religiously, and otherwise, had to be exactly aligned before poor old John, out eating locust and wild honey, received the word of the Lord. It's not your fault to control circumstances outside your control. That's a category mistake. You can't do that. You say, well, look at my age. God doesn't consider age the way we do. Have you figured that out? Caleb was 85 after he came out of the circularity of 38 years. Did you know sometimes you're in 38 years of circularity because someone else screwed up? Not you. Remember the children of Israel? God sent 12 spies into the land to spy out the land and bring back a good report. And 10 of the 12 came back and said, nay, we can't do it. We be of the, ch the church of we be not able we be not able. Ten of the twelve said, we can't. There's giants. We're going to be eaten alive. Caleb and Joshua, who had another spirit, said, no, we are well able to take the land. Let us go up at once. Their defense has departed from them. Their breakfast cereal for us to eat. And yet, because of the unbelief of the ten, Caleb and Joshua had to go into 38 years of circularity with them. Wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault. You know? And you know what? You don't even want to get peeved at the other people because 40 years of bitterness is not going to do well. So you know what? I think Caleb and Joshua just said, well, whoopsie doodle. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get better, not bitter. And yet for 38 years, Caleb had seen the mountain of Hebron full of giants. And he had fantasized for 38 years in his circularity. When I get back, I'm going to go to Hebron. I'm going to take that mountain. I'm going to kick those demon-possessed giants out. I'm going to get them. And after 38 years, at 85, he came out and he pointed to Hebron and said, give me that mountain. And they said, okay. And no one was allowed to take the mountain of Hebron with the demon-possessed giants for 38 years because that was set aside for Caleb. I know all the old man verses. Now, Jacob was, was 65 when he met Rachel. Well, three more years in my case. <laughs> Hope springs eternal, Josie. <laughs> Breakdown or breakthrough. Mm, Abraham's at this point with God. I mean, he's utterly, he's panicked. But see, do you see the good news here? He's starting to realize in his depression that he's incapable in his own strength. Oh, ding, 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 ding. When you hear the bell go to geometry, ding, ding, ding. Yes, you're impotent. Yeah, you're old, old man. Yeah, nothing's happened till now. Now God says, now I can move. Now I can get all the glory. Now, I can bring all that fruit in a moment that you've been waiting all your life for. Oh, my God, my God. I might preach this thing right. Get that hanky out, Maria. I feel that 30-year-old preacher coming on, man. <laughs> when I was 30, I could sing, my God, my God. Had control of that voice. <laughs> Come on. You know what I'm talking about, Sammy. You wake up one day and the voice is like, you know, it's like, what was that? In the name of Jesus. I don't receive this in Jesus' name. <laughs> Brian McLean told me a joke once. He said he was at this church, church camp and there was a word of faith group and a Baptist group and they were doing tug of war over this mud ditch and the word of faith people got pulled in, but they wouldn't receive it. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> the devil is a lie. They wouldn't even accept the, all that mud all over their face. So Abraham's at the breaking point. And, and listen, let me read the text. What happens? Genesis 15, 12 through 16. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. Hebrew word is tardema. means a divine Holy Ghost. <laughs> A posture from whence you can receive from the Lord and he can speak to you. Did you know sometimes he has to knock us into a tardema just to even get our attention and for us to sit still long enough to, so he can tell us something good. <laughs> Sorry about all those tubes, but <laughs> I was just, you won the lottery. You know, he's been chasing us down to give us a lottery ticket. We think we're going to be murdered. Anyway, as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, that they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. And in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites is not yet fully measured. Whoa, 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 whoa. Abraham was missing these factoids about the stuff that was out of his control that didn't allow him to have his fruitfulness. Oh, my God. God knocks him down under a tarnamen and says, I need you to shut up and lay down. So I can show you it's just a bigger story. That's all. It's a bigger story than you thought. Well, I never thought that was going to happen. My God, when that, yeah, it's just a bigger story. That's the truth. And Abraham is now like, you know, it has to be medicated, right? Like most of them. <laughs> just to sit down and shut up long enough for him to be able to say, now it's a bigger story. Let me show you the tapestry. You don't worry. You're going to die good old age. You're going to have a wonderful life. This isn't going to involve you. But, and he starts telling him about the seed that he's been promised. They're going to go into a land they don't know. They're going to be enslaved for 400, 430 years. But when they come out, oh, they're going to come out wealthy. You know, God always sends you into Egypt and brings you out with something you normally wouldn't have had. And hopefully it's not a disease. But in this case, they're going to bring all the money out of Egypt. But he gives this panorama of four, four, five hundred years of history while Abraham is laying down on the ground and God goes, honey, see, there's a reason why there has been a delay in your fruitfulness and it's got nothing to do with you. Any more than you could control who's going to be Pharaoh, how long those people are going to be in bondage. And notice he says to Abraham, don't worry, honey, you're just watching the TV show. You're going to die a good old age. You're going to heaven. It's going to be well with you. But I've got to tell you, it's a bigger story. There are details and factors that you could not control in any context, just like you can't control having a baby right now. <laughs> well, is there any, is, what's that Viagra? I mean, what, what, what's right? No, 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 blue pill is going to help him. Nothing, nothing. I mean, he and Sarah are a joke. I mean, together, it's like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Darling, I... Can't get enough of your love. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Not going to work. Nothing. Nothing. And God says, I like it that way. I like, I, I brought you to an end of yourself before the fruit can kick in. Whew. I think he felt a little bit better after that. Hmm. After Genesis 15, I think he's feeling pretty good. He gets up from that tardema. Ah, he goes, well, oh, there are things beyond me I have no control over. Oh, there are circumstances. John the Baptist is waiting in the, in the wilderness, waiting for what? The 15th year of Tiberius. The emperor had to be his 15th year. Pontius Pilate had a five governor. They brought in. Who, who's the next pilot? Oh, he's in. Good. And, and even if you knew that, like, <clears throat> you're two out of three ain't bad. It's like, well, Maybe three of the blocks, Lego blocks, are where they're supposed to be. Nothing happens. The word of the Lord would not be released to John until everybody, politically and otherwise, were in their place, religiously and otherwise. And then, and these people, most of these people were dogs. We're talking about, we're not, God's not making a moral comment on who they were. He's just saying that the furniture has been moved into place. Now you can open 
for business. And the word of the Lord came to John. I'm sure he was happy. He's out there eating his locusts and wild honey, looking all weird as usual, wearing his camel's hair outfit. Now, we talked about this at length with John, but honey, locusts, the Bible says they're clean. You could eat them. They're kosher. They're kashrut. But they look weird. And there's a lot of stuff that looks weird in your life, but it's kosher. Well, what about all those events? You're eating. He was there 30 years. He's eating locust. It's kosher, but it looks weird. You know, that's going to be really troubling with the Christian mingle folk. In case John was in the beard full. It's full of locusts. And wild honey, did you know according to Jewish law, bees were unclean? But the honey's clean. So it's like, who is this weirdo? And and his clothes were camel's hair. Camels are unclean, but you could use their hair. John was a living example of crazy in the natural. People looking in, they're just going, this guy's nuts. Guy's out of his mind. He's on the border. He's on the cusp of orthodoxy. You know, he's eating all this stuff that's a little iffy. Eh, the locusts are clean, but they're nasty looking. When I did teach on that, I brought an actual container of locusts and offered them to the room. We had one taker, I believe. Who, uh, Joel. Yeah. Bless your heart. <laughs> John was in all of his weirdness waiting for the word of the Lord to come to release him. And guess what? It had to do with stuff he couldn't control. He couldn't even pray it in. So be at peace, Abraham. Lay down in your tardema. Shh. You're not responsible for timing that is out of your hands. You are not responsible for men and women, boys and girls, to make the right decisions they need to make in order to participate in the timing. You just You just smile real big and do the next right thing and just hopefully choose to bathe in the peace of the Lord while you're waiting. Because you know what? For us to get, remember Jesus said, you know, worrying is like a rocking chair. Gives you something to do, doesn't get you anywhere. Jesus said all the worry in the world will not add four inches to your height. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. There's plenty today to keep you busy. Tomorrow will take care of itself. If we could just walk in a little peace the next little while, knowing that he's in sovereign control of everything, that he who gave the promise will bring the performance, that we are not responsible for the delay of our own fruitfulness. You say, well, what's fruitfulness? Well, I'm not talking about diamonds and Rolexes. I'm talking about something much better. Let me just read let me just read a little stitch. Do you remember Jacob's kids? Remember in Genesis 49, he, had, uh, he spoke a prophetic word over each of his children? Well, his son named Judah, by the way, Judah wound up being the firstborn. He wasn't literally the firstborn. Reuben was the firstborn, but God had to remove him. And Levi had to remove him. And about fourth in line is Judah. God had to take the first three out of the way to bring Judah up. And he'll take anybody out of the way he needs to take out of the way in his timing to bring you up. Selah. But listen to the prosperity he promised over um, Judah. Let's listen to it. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He said Judah's donkey is going to be tied to the vine of wine. It's an interesting, it's a prosperity. It's an overall fruitfulness in every direction unknown before now. Judah's prosperity is is seen to be ridiculous. He was seen as binding his donkey to the choicest vine. So immense was the productivity and fruitfulness of the land that a donkey could be tied almost anywhere, an unclean beast, which would certainly eat everything in sight and then run away to eat the rest. There would be so much prosperity for Judah that instead of using common water to do laundry, 
The women would use the finest wines, the blood of grapes, to wash all their dirty laundry. <laughs> that's, that's crazy prosperity. Nobody was going to hook their donkey to a choice vine that's just going to eat everything and run through everything and make a mess. But there was so much fruit that was promised. Beloved, you can have five apple seeds in your hand. That's addition. But you take any one of them and you plant them in the ground and let them die. And that's multiplication. We have been addicted to addition. How many people are here? What's going on? <laughs> Everything's one, two, three, four, five. That's addition. God is so over addition. He wants to do multiplication. And that's what we're looking for. Don't just count up apple seeds and keep them in a jar. Plant one in good soil and that will happen. Everything will happen that needs to happen. Beloved, there's a ridiculous sense of, of fruitfulness that is yet ahead of us. Listen to John 12, 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the Feast of Passover. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This metaphor is not found in the Old Testament anywhere. But did you notice the group of folk that came, the Greeks? There was a religious order called the Eleusinian Mystery Religions, a very secretive group at the time of Jesus. And the Greeks had a little story of Demeter and Persephone. I don't know if you remember any of the Greek legends. Demeter, she was the goddess of the ground and the grain, and Persephone was her beautiful daughter. And her beautiful daughter, it says the earth opened up, and Hades came up, and he stole Persephone. And he fed her some pomegranate seeds, and she was lured into having to be kept in the underworld for three months a year. And when she was stolen, Demeter became so upset that she just scoured the world and all the leaves died and the fruit would die and the ground would grow cold and the snow was everywhere. And they used this metaphor to explain why things die and then spring comes back. So Persephone was allowed to come forth back to her mother Demeter for nine months a year, but when the sun would wane, there she would go back down with Hades, and she had to stay in the underworld for three months. Well, the Eleusinian mystery religions were based on this story, and they used to, all we know about them, we don't really know anything other than they used to put a little stock of grain on their altar. But many commentators suggest since this idea of a seed dying and then resurrection life coming isn't an Old Testament thing, Jesus could have been building a bridge because the Greeks, if they belonged to the Eleusinian mystery religion, and that should, would, would be supported by their interest in the Passover, they, came, they were interested in the imagery of the Passover, again, the dying and the rising again, that Jesus was building a bridge, that he was saying to them, all your life you've sought a seed, that dies and rises. I am that seed. I am the fulfillment of all your longings. Loved one, it's got to die for fruit to come. And you know, sometimes, this is a little prophetic word I got this month. I feel sometimes while we're not looking, things have died that we're not really aware of. Dreams we've had, hopes we've had thoughts we've had. But they have to die in order for multiplication and fruitfulness to emerge. There are some things that have died that God himself has, a, and you're going to see in the next little while fruit just come up behind you. It's like, what? where'd you come from? Where'd you, well, because some things have died authentically that needed to die, and you haven't noticed it yet. Remember Amos 9, it's the imagery of people being, you know, outrun by the, their harvest is running up behind them and slapping them in the back of the head. And you turn around and there's the harvest and it's, and, it's, and it's so lush and it's so beautiful and it's so like the stars of the heavens, but you forgot about it. 
you know, you've just been so Abrahamish and Sarahish. <laughs> remember the Abra- Remember the angel said to Abraham, "This time next year, Sarah's going to have a baby." What'd she do? <laughs> she laughs. Mm-hmm. She says, "Shall I have pleasure of my Lord being 90? <laughs> and the angel said, "You laugh." She goes, "No, nay, I didn't laugh." He goes, "Nay, you laughed." But you know what? She was giggling because she had that old man has made a move in years. Bless his heart. I hope he has a lot of money. That's what people think when I'm walking around Squire, <laughs> walking around with Rebecca at the mall. They go, you know, he's got money. You know, he's got money. He's got something we don't see. <laughs> Yeah, ka God knows what's dying and what has died. And you just don't remember anymore. And all of a sudden, just, but I'm saying, watch for the fruit. Keep your nose fresh here. You're going to start smelling some fresh fruit, that Gelson's fruit, not that demonic fruit you get at Aldi. Oops. Hope I don't get sued. You know what I mean? It looks like an apple. It feels like an apple. It's red like an apple. And you go home and it just, oh, what a disappointment. People say, yes, Craig, that's my whole life. No, no, be encouraged. The good Gelson's fruit is on the way. Breakdown or breakthrough, it's a breakthrough. Is the sun rising or setting? It's rising. God is not a liar. So shall his word as it comes out of his mouth. Every word he sent forth will never come back without the fulfillment he sent it to bring. It's just not on our time. But you know what? What else is new? I'm as dumb as a post. I've got a brain, a pea brain the size of a thimble. It would be like to answer my questions I ask God, he'd have to put the Pacific Ocean in a thimble. Ain't going to happen. So you know what? I have to quit asking why and just say, What is before me today, Lord? I'm going to keep good spirits. I'm going to stay at peace because I'm going to believe this long war against the house of David and Saul. There doesn't seem to be any break. The house of David is slowly emerging. It's a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough. I want to pray again for every dream in your life, beloved, for every promise over your family, Every promise when you were a teenager, every dream you just sort of picked up through osmosis, the brother of Moses, I pray, God, that you would bring a sense of relief and release and peace. If there need to be tears, let them come. Let the tears, the diamond dust, polishes all God's jewels, Lord. Tears are a language God understands, Lord. Release the tears that need to be released so that we are fortified with a new sense of hope and faith, God. I pray for every girl that's been given a promise, Lord, that you courage her heart and bless her and let her know that you're bigger than despair, you're bigger than doubt, you're bigger than uh, desperation. Father, for every one of your sons, Thank you that Abraham had no power in his own strength to bring anything to pass, let alone the promise. So, Father, we do fall back in your arms as Abraham's and Sarah's. Whatever age, whether we're little, whether we're older, whatever age, God, we fall back in your hands. We know only you can bring fruit that has been promised. So, Father, again, our lives are yours. We belong to you, spirit, soul, and body. Everything we are, we cast upon you, Lord. Use us in any way you see fit to bring about the fruitfulness that will show that we're going to see the breakthrough you promised us. Someone say amen. God is faithful. He's faithful. Now, he doesn't always do everything the way we thought. Look about it, everything in your life. You never thought anything that happened would happen the way it happened. But you know what? It's not over until he says it's over. You're immortal till your time comes. Some folk, they just keep showing up like a bad penny. Others, there's so many prettier, smarter people than you, dead six feet under the ground. Folk that had every talent, every ability, every anointing, they're dead and gone. Here we are. The Abraham and Sarah band, amen, with, with four of our banjo strings still intact. 
<laughs> I remember Jason Upton said, I'd rather hear an anointed banjo player with two strings than some of these worship folk. Because <laughs> when you have the anointing of God, that carries the day. Amen. So do you see, we're where we've always been. We are his servants. We belong to him. Our lives are not our own. We share in them for a time. He is the Lord and master of our destiny. So take heart. Be encouraged. It's a breakthrough, not a breakdown. I want you to feel that, that sense of waking up from a deep tardema where the Lord will be, maybe he'll whisper to you the next, this week some of the reasons why your fruitfulness has been delayed. Like he told, Abraham's was a different set of circumstances. But maybe he'll start giving you just a few little insights as to why the furniture isn't yet fully in place, the pipes aren't fully aligned. And who said you wouldn't be this age before it happened? Maybe fairy tale thinking, maybe, maybe your weird ideas, but you know what? Abraham was right on time at 100, and Sarah at 90, right on time. God is never early, but he's never late. So I just want to bless you one more time. Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness, Lord. And we just serve you. We choose to serve you, God, whether we can read the signs of the times or not, whether we can properly put the pieces of the puzzle together. Lord, we thank you, God, that we're going to do the next right thing. We're just going to take the next right step, that we're going to have you just give us a next, enough light to see the next right step to take. And we thank you, Father, for your faithfulness today. And let's pray for our beloved sister, Josie. Josie, honey, can you come up? Sammy, help come up here, dear woman of God. She's seen, she's seen, watch out now, honey. I get the same feeling when I try to get up. Billy Holiday beat her up in a bathroom when she was 19. Say that fast, real, <laughs> six times. <laughs> was she not a sweetheart, Billy? Yeah, but she was high and she thought I was hitting on her husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would have thrown you down the stairs. If I were there to counsel Billy Holiday, <laughs> Josie and I have known each other. Josie's known me since I was a little pup. You were so young and cute, barefoot, preaching at the hiding place. Yep. And I thought, this is the church for me. <laughs> ha! Woman of God lived all of her life serving Jesus. Father, we bless. Extend your hands at home. We bless you for this dear window to eternity, your daughter Josie. She's a window to eternity, Lord. We look through her and we see your beauty and your grace and your kindness. Lord God, we thank you so much for allowing her to be born. We thank you so much, Lord Jesus, that you said live. In her mother's afterbirth, you said live. And all these years she has walked with you and has served you, God. We thank you so much that you would refresh her spirit, Lord that your precious anointing would come upon her, Lord. All the well-dones she would hear in her mind and in her soul. Thank you so much that she is a living example of a lighthouse, Lord. She has no idea how many ships have been saved because of her standing and just shining her light. She has no idea the lives that have been touched and, and blessed and transformed for her just standing her ground and light, shining her light, Jesus. So we ask you to refresh our sister today. Give her encouragement, Lord. We bless you for her in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, Amen woman of God. Thank you. God bless you. Do you have anything to say? I love Jesus. I follow Jesus, but I'm not crazy about his bride. <laughs> we love God. And if he didn't have to use his people, he could do endless things in the world. <laughs> Josie, I love you. You're not crazy. Sammy, help her, help her to the gate. <laughs> we love you at home. God bless you. If you have prayer requests, send them in. If you want to bless us and support us, if we feed you, you feed us. It's easy to do online. You just go right online, drcraigjohnson.org. We have a 1,000 messages there for free. You don't charge you anything. You just go there and binge if you want. There's something for everybody. And if you go way back, you'll hear my high voice. Yeah. Yeah, my son was listening to a tape from me. He said, Daddy, your voice is really going downhill. I said, yeah, well, 
you know, I talked like Mickey Mouse in, in, in 86, but you can have that experience too. We've even got some old music from when I was 13 back, some of those Capitol Records songs that'll, uh, that are so embarrassing and why did I just draw attention to them? Well, I'd better quit talking before I do any more damage. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful week. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.